Picklesburg has turned me away at the bridge. I, Brian Crawford, tried to make my way to P Picklesburg just yesterday. I get there, I'm excited, I'm ready to try some pickles. I was even going to get one of the little pickle balloons that you saw everybody walking around with. I left work Saturday afternoon, very excited to check out Picklesburg, just bursting with excitement. And as I walk closer, I get to the river trail, and I see all of these boats all over the place, boats attached to boats, people camping out on the river trail with food spreads and all sorts of great things, wearing pickle merchandise. And I got more excited. And as I crept closer, I got more and more excited about this idea. I love partying on the bridge. The first time I partied on a bridge was during the yarn party, the yarning party, if you remember, when they yarned the Andy Warhol Bridge and the county closed the bridge to throw a party to celebrate the yarning of the bridge. What a cool thing that was. And they donated all of the yarn on the bridge to homeless people so that way they would have something warm to sleep with. I loved the yarned bridge party. And I hadn't made it to Picklesburg quite yet any of the previous years. This was the first time I was going to experience it, and I remembered that bridge party, and I kept getting more and more excited. And I get to PNC Park. I walk the steps, and then I see this giant fence that just keeps going and going and going down the street. And I thought, wow, this is annoying, but once I get around to that fence, I will finally get to experience Picklesburg. And it was packed. The place was packed. And I approached the bridge. And as I ac approached the bridge, somebody started moving one of those horse saws right in front of me. The guy from security he goes, we're temporarily closing the bridge. No explanation. No compassion. I, Brian Crawford, some, you know me, I come to enjoy this great festival of Picklesburg. And I was turned away, given the cold shoulder, sent off out into the city after I walked all the way there from my place of employment on California Avenue. So I will not be back to Picklesburg. No, I will not be going back to be turned away yet again. You would think that the people running P Picklesburg would know big-time people like Brian Crawford, like you. I'm sure you listening, you're important. And I'm sure if you made your way down to Picklesburg, you would be upset as well. You would be in a pickle yourself. This is River Talk, where I will not send you away. No, you've come here on the Facebook Live feed if you're watching us live, 7 p.m. on Sundays, or if you're listening at riversedgepgh.com or on TuneIn Radio tomorrow at, or Monday morning, 10 a.m., we are not going to turn you away. You have not come to be shown the door. No, we are welcoming you in to the show, and we will take as many people that are willing to listen. There are no boundaries. There are no restrictions. And if you have a comment, you can leave us a comment right here in the chat room, or you can tweet us at RiverTalkPGH, or you can text us at 412-407-2PGH. That's 412-407-2744. I am Brian Crawford. This is River Talk. And this is the River's Edge Radio Network, Pittsburgh's voice for local music at riversedgepgh.com. My soul that day during Picklesburg, I feel like it was just ripped out. I could have died in disappointment. And if I do die from a disappointing pickle fest, please haul my body to Han Funeral Home, the only family-owned funeral home here in Millville, and known for the green burial. Green just like a pickle. That's Han Funeral Home. I'm Brian Crawford. This is River Talk. And we're going to talk about the, the big music ecosystem report that was just released. Had some really, really interesting things in that report. Don Pitts, the man who was hired to put together the report he'll be calling in at 7:15 so that's 7:15 here on the live 10:15 a.m. tomorrow morning on Monday morning if you're listening on the live on the 24-hour stream 
I'm interested to talk to him about what he went through, how he organized the report, what he his thoughts were on the city of Pittsburgh based on other cities that he has that he's looked into as well. He had a lot of case studies, so you know he's done a lot of research into a lot of the different music scenes around the country to kind of come up with some of the solutions that he put in the report. So we're going to talk to him. Also get his thoughts on the town hall that kind of kicked off the report and some of the the reception that he got and some of the comments that he had heard from musicians and, and how that influenced the direction that he went in putting together the report. Scott Mervis reached out to a few big shot people in Pittsburgh to hear their thoughts on the report. There were some interesting comments in there. Of course, he asked Brian Crawford to give his comments, and my comments were there. I really, I really was happy to see the report really focus on education because one of the things that I, I feel is that we could be more educated on, on how we can succeed as business people in the music community. And you often hear people talking about not wanting to do a lot of these things, but I, I think if you're passionate about your brand, you're going to handle the business end of it as well. But I think creating the tools to educate people and, and make the business end of music easier to handle I think that's really vital, and the report really touches on that. It was interesting to read what makes up a musician, the the income that a lot of musicians here in Pittsburgh make. A lot of that was not surprising to me. The fact that there are a higher level of musicians with bachelor's degrees based on compared to the general public, I did not think that was surprising as well. And that's just because if you're involved in the music community – you meet a lot of people and you, and you kind of see where they're coming from and when you talk to people anecdotally, you discover where in life they've gone, uh, what their education is, and most of the people I know are very well educated in the music community, but they're, they're working a lot of smaller part-time jobs and stringing things together to make a financial plan that allows them to play their music and when you and it is true when you're when you're working in so many different places and I've worked multiple jobs before in my life in fact most of my life I've worked multiple jobs and it does become very draining and it becomes very complex i think that's the biggest thing when you are working multiple jobs it becomes very complex to handle the business side of the music community one of the things also that i was really excited to see in this report was some direction to handle the venue crisis that we have here in the city. And that has to deal with the the liquor license restrictions. The arc and, I, and I rephrased it specifically in my quote to the Post-Gazette as discriminatory, archaic, prohibition-era LCB regulations that close down venues and make it disadvantageous for a venue to embrace music, in particular local music, because a lot of the venues that cannot take that leap are smaller venues or cannot afford the the remodeling needs to make local music work or music at all work are, are some of these smaller venues. And especially when it comes down to sound ordinances. The liquor, And the reason why I, I called it discriminatory legislation is because the LCB regulations on entertainment, specifically, obviously, target places that sell alcohol. So if you don't sell alcohol, if it's a uh, BYOB type of establishment or a coffee house, you can play music at a much louder level and not face anywhere near the, the repercussions that you're going to face as someone who, who owns a bar, a bar establishment. To me, that doesn't make any sense. Loud noise is loud noise. It doesn't matter whether you own a bar or you own a coffee house. And the fact that these the, the calls that it takes to shut a venue down can be done anonymously, to me, that's ludicrous. You could have somebody living in another state calling in. They could have a grudge, say, I, Brian Crawford, turn this studio into a music venue, and I get a liquor license to sell 
alcohol here at this music venue. And somebody who has listened to my show out in Punxsutawney, or not Punxsutawney, yeah, Punxsutawney, we'll say Punxsutawney, out in the middle of the state. They don't like Brian Crawford because Brian Crawford has criticized Governor Wolf over taxation, we'll say. So he wants to really stick it to me. And he calls in anonymously and says, Brian Crawford has music playing outside on the street. He's breaking the LCB regulations. Well, then the LCE, the Liquor Control Enforcement, which is the part of the state police that enforces the liquor laws, they come by and say the door is opened and there's no one living around the studio, at least not in an earshot of the music, but they can hear the music on the sidewalk. Boom, slapped with a fine. So lots of great things in here. Those were some of my comments. Maybe if we get into it, we have more time. I could read some of the other comments dealing with the study. I really liked what Lauren uh, Demichel, uh I'm sorry, I don't know how to say Lauren's last name, Lauren of Fair Play Pittsburgh, uh, Demichelli, I believe. She said that there's a lot of folks in Pittsburgh working on initiatives to make the scene better, and I am happy that the leaders in the community took steps to create a roadmap for us to follow. That's not to say our needs will change as time goes on, but I see the Pittsburgh Ecosystem Report as a unifying initiative, and it'll work if we let it. I agree. I think it makes a, a lot of sense. I was really happy to uh, see that comment as well. There's uh, lots of good stuff there. So I'm going to take a quick break, and that is so I can get Don Pitts on the phone. Don Pitts will be joining me right after this break. We've got some Steel City Broad from Victory at the Crossroads, our good friend Liz Victory of that broadcast, who goes on the Facebook Live occasionally. She's on tour across the United States right now, but we have that song for you while we prepare for Mr. Pitts right here on the River's Edge. Brian Crawford letting you know that Kevin Slogic, my State Farm agent in Allison Park, is here to help life go right and reminds you that you're listening to the River's Edge Radio Network. All right, we are back here on the River's Edge Radio Network. Brian Crawford behind the microphone here at Mr. Small's Theater. Love being here at Mr. Small's. Just enjoyed the Cafe Sunday Fun Day down at the Small's Cafe, which is right below the main theater towards the, the back end of the theater stage at Mr. Small's. Lots of great stuff there. One of the, the great venues we have here in town. Love being here at Mr. Small's. On the phone, though, to speaking of local venues and local music, which they always have at the Cafe Sunday Fun Day, we have Mr. Don Pitts on the line calling in from Austin. Uh, let me see here. We got him right there. Sorry, I am running solo today. So, uh, Don, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Great. So we've got Don here in the studio. Don, tell me a little bit about the about the report. What what got the ball rolling? Was it the, the town hall meeting? Is that kind of where you, you got your start? Or were you researching what was going on here in the Pittsburgh music scene before that? Uh, that's a good question. Um, we started the project. Uh, we started talking to in Pittsburgh uh, around June or July of last year, uh, or even before that, and having a conversation this summer. Um, we actually started uh, end of October. Okay, wow. With, with so, how does Pittsburgh? How does the entire music ecosystem here in Pittsburgh compare to other cities of of Pittsburgh's size? Obviously, the talents here. You you look at these music festivals, the the Deutschtown Music Festival, the Millville Music Festival. We we used to actually have three music festivals here in Pittsburgh, and all of them were were wildly attended really showcases the the music scene here on the river's edge we're a hundred percent local original music on the river's edge so obviously the talent is here maybe the musicians just aren't getting the love that they they should financially in that live shows where where people have to make a decision that to go that where it's not as easy as a festival so can you tell me a little bit about our ecosystem what what are the, the biggest challenges here in Pittsburgh outside of venues, which I, I talked about in my opening remarks? I think the venue situation in Pittsburgh is really dire in terms of these just archaic 
LCB prohibition era regulations that are designed to basically shut down bars. Yeah, well, so, I mean, the fragmentation, uh, I think, it, in Pittsburgh, I think the community, I think there's some folks that are, you know, at least, there's definitely collaboration going and happening in the community. Uh, but as a whole, I think there was just, you know, there's just a lot of fragmentation, and I don't think it's, uh, it's not anything new. I mean, other cities, I think, given today's music industry, uh, especially for independent musicians, I mean, that's, I think that's the, the nature of these ecosystems, that, that they are fragment, fragmented. Um, I think the Pittsburgh, I think what was really surprising to me from being involved in, in, in regulatory stuff within city government for seven years, just the regulatory environment, which is what you touched on. Uh, you know, I, I think there are a lot of venues. Uh, early on in the project and the research, we, you know, there's just, you know, looking at the history, there was a, you know, apparently there's a lot of live music venues in the, in the past. Uh, and there's, you know, there's some good venues in Pittsburgh now, but, you know, we saw some venue deserts um, in some of the neighborhoods. But then really looking, you know, at the regulatory landscape, I, I think that's, uh, I think a barrier for a lot of businesses that would, could and, and should uh, host live music. I think I, I think that's a barrier. Uh, it's just it's a pretty complex regulatory environment. Yeah, it's it's crazy. I I, I think it's designed to, to shut down bars. Uh, I mean, I, I think it, this probably dates back. Do you know how 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 old these regulations are that that govern sound? Oh, yeah. I mean, they 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 go back. I mean, they've been you know periodically you know, updated at, at various parts. But, you know, the challenge that we first heard was, you know, from the venue owners is that, you know, we can't do anything about the sound ordinance because, you know, that's controlled by the state if you have a liquor license. And so um, we started digging in and thanks to some very uh, smart people in the community that we met with, you know, attorneys and so forth that really kind of, really kind of showed us the, Hey, yeah, there are ways that, that the city can actually uh, adopt, you know, and take control of the sound ordinance in certain districts. Uh, but there's a, there's a process for that. So we tried to lay that out in the report. Now, when you talk about the fragmentation of the music scene, are you talking about uh, from a resource level or from uh, the way shows are developed and not mixing different genres? Can you explain that a little bit more? Because I, I do see especially at, at the festivals you see a lot of different genres coming together, but I, I have some seen some shows where, where people do mix the genres, but you do get a lot of these clicks as well. Is that what you're referring to, or are you referring to more of, of the sharing of, of resources? Well, I think, it, I think it's a little bit of everything. You know, I mean, I think these festivals that are hosting the, you know, and showcasing these different genres of music, you know, such a local, local diversity uh, and genres, I, I I mean, I think that's a good thing, but I think if you go back to, you know, looking at the root cause, uh, you know, what's happening 364 days a year. Uh, like I said, I mean, I think there's collaboration happening. Uh, the thing about collaboration also is that it really needs to be organic. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, I think you can create some systems and processes in place to kind of let whatever happens, happens. Um, I like to refer to it, I mean, for years, it's kind of, just create this petri dish and just let whatever happens, happens. And I think uh, there's some aspects of the ecosystem that, that just you just need to create a petri dish and put in those places and, and let it happen. Let it happen. You had mentioned uh, a lot about education, especially educating people in the music scene in the business end of, of the the scene and, and the, the lobbying end and things like that. You, you mentioned in the report that we should, instead of creating a new organization, we should use existing structures. Are there any structures that you've pointed, that you've thought of, or that you've seen here in Pittsburgh that you think could handle some of these education and advocacy parts of the report that you have stressed that need to happen to, uh, to grow this scene? Well, I think, you know, 
Yeah, I mean, I think all the institutions do that. I, guess. I think uh, the Greater Pittsburgh Arts Council, uh, I think Fair Play, Pittsburgh, uh, they're doing some great things, and they've been in the trenches. Um, you know, I think it's going to take, I'm a big believer that it's going to take entities that historically haven't worked together mm-hmm. uh, to come together. And I think, you know, I think Point Park, uh, I think it, Ed's program there at Point Park is should be a, an enormous pipeline for music business talent um, that, 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 that's coming in you know from the pipeline to these musicians. Do you think some sort of a convention might help? I know in the podcasting world, because my radio network, we have uh, our hands in two different pots here, where we're in the music scene, but we're also into this online media scene. And for years, there's been this this convention here in Pittsburgh, an educational convention called PodCamp, and they specifically teach people how to podcast. They bring in organizations such as Libsyn, which is a local podcast host in Pittsburgh, to give seminars. They have all sorts of educational seminars from everything from marketing to different equipment that you need. And obviously, our musicians, a lot of them have some of the equipment stuff ironed out. Obviously, they're out there performing and, and doing those types of things. But do you think some sort of a seminar-style convention to teach people about the state government, which is confusing, it's it's the second largest full-time legislature, or is it the, full, the largest full-time legislature in the country? So there's a lot of, of confusion in dealing with state government and uh, and obviously with dealing with regulations and things like that. Do you think a seminar would be helpful or do you think that it needs to be something that's more sustaining? Uh, you know, I'm a, I'm a big fan of, of, of workshops, seminars, uh, just some really kind of what we call how to, how to education. Um, you know, there's over 200, 300, but we're, we're, I'm working on another project right now with some colleagues in Chicago. And, uh, there's about 300 revenue streams is what they're up to now for independent musicians. And, you know, on one hand, you know, I think the frustration for musicians is that, I mean, it's a, it's a very complex, <clears throat> uh, you know, there's about a dozen alphabet soup agencies that you have to register your music with. And yeah, that's, that's a whole other uh, you know, performance rights organization, how-to workshops. Yeah, I think I think you have to be careful in um, really. I think you have to stay inside the sectors of the ecosystem and the industry. If you're going to do the houses, I think and historically the venue owners and venue management, venue managers and operators, you know, they've got they've got a really specified list of what they need uh, to fix. And I, and I think for the venues, I think there's a whole other path forward that, that I think would work uh, for some kind of doing that work for the last 10 years. But, I mean, it, but yes, to answer your question, um, you know, workshop seminars, um, really, just, it's much information. You need, you've got to make them um, um, obviously, you know, worth worth a while but yeah the challenge also in, in with music is that there are so many different people at so many different levels um so what we've seen working and and before is is really you know doing programming for these these workshops and seminars to to try to hit the musicians and music business people at whatever level they're at yeah, I, I think that's important, and I think that's also important whenever you put together a seminar like this, is you need to have a, a range of options for people from beginner to expert because and get some of those experts to then come in and teach the seminars too, I think is key. That's one thing that they've done really well with, with PodCamp over the years is bringing in experts, even from around the country, to, to come and talk about podcasting and how to, to grow the brand and how to make podcasting profitable and, and things like that. So I think you need to bring in experts, especially experts from the local community, but you need to have a, a wide ver- variety of tools available. Intro to marketing 
isn't going to work for, for some of the musicians who have been around for years and have been successful. Meeting of Important People comes to mind. They do a fantastic job. They're in all of the big events here. First night, they played at the the uh, the arts festival last year on the main stage. They're everywhere. They may not benefit from an intro to marketing, but maybe taking the band to the next step onto a national scene might be a course that would be interesting to them. Absolutely. So you were. And you bring up a good point. Uh, mm-hmm. I'm sorry, but you bring up a good point, and we try to bring it up in, in the report. That you 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 talk about looking at podcasts, and and what we're trying to say is, is look at other industries, uh, like health and you know health industry, you know the the legal industry. I mean, just there's look at other industries of how they're doing that outreach education um, and workforce development, and I, you know I think borrow some ideas from. Um, from these other industry sectors. Oh, I agree completely. I've been saying that for a long time. In the arts community, you also often hear this this negative view of sports and how sports operates. But you don't hear that same thing coming from the sporting world. You look at the NFL. NFL films are what they are, really, because of the music that you add to NFL films. Uh, the sporting world has learned to use other forms of entertainment to help build their brand instead of fighting. And I know here with the River's Edge, for example, we've gone out before shows, before festivals, and we'll do a broadcast with the stage in the background. It's almost like the, the commentators at a sporting event with the field in the background. So we've tried to, to learn from some of these other mediums. And I think whenever you're willing to look at the way other businesses operate and steal ideas from them and make them your own and re- reinvent them for yourself, you can really, really expand your audience and be very creative in that way. Oh, absolutely. I, I, you know, pro sports, I, I heard a lot of Pittsburgh that, you know, blaming that the three sports teams, professional sports teams, um, you know, is, is the deterrent for from the fans. And um, I ran the, I started the pro sports division at Gibson Guitars when I uh, worked in the entertainment division uh, for a couple of decades. And there is a lot of similarities between the, the, the NFL, because of baseball, uh, and the NHL, I worked with all of those uh, leagues and, and the players and the teams. Um, and they all, you know, there's a lot of aspiring musicians that are on those teams. Mm-hmm. Um, so I, I think there's a lot of, uh, I think, you know, obviously the, 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 the three teams aren't going to go anywhere. So I would, I'm, I'm more of a mindset of like, well, well let's, let's figure out how we can make it work for Pittsburgh music. Yeah, yeah. I look at the Hawkeyes, for example. They were actually, this is kind of cool, they received a phone call from a phone number in Canada, and here it was someone from one of the NHL offices asking them to perform at the outside game at Heinz Field, one of the the winner games. And it was a great uh, opportunity for them. They were out before an entire stadium, Heinz Field, an entire stadium worth of people uh, to perform, a local musician, I, I think they actually got some some coverage on the the television as well, but yeah, I think you need to look at those opportunities and try to to grab them. You, uh, the anthem singer for the Penguins is actually in a local band here in Pittsburgh, so there are some opportunities to to collaborate and try to bring some of those audiences, some of the sports audiences, over to you because. Believe it or not, people like a multitude of things. I you know people like sports and music and theater. So I, I think there's some room to to learn and utilize some of those opportunities as well. So. Well, and I think what we've learned uh, from doing a lot of stuff in NASCAR uh, t- ten or fifteen years ago uh, with, with music, and I think there's a lot of stuff on the table that marketing and promotion wise that we that musicians kind of leave on the table and don't ask for. They get to those situations of like singing the national anthem or performing, you know, pre-game or post-game. Uh, you know, I would approach that like any other any other event that you're playing, where you just get as much promotions. No, I think a lot of these teams wouldn't mind, you know, doing an article or a spotlight uh, on on their fan website or something. You know, getting getting more than just the, the performance or the or the performing national anthem. And I think simply knowing what to ask for. Um, is another thing, and treat it like a like a regular gig. 
Yeah, I agree completely. Uh, real quick, before I uh, let you go here, I am on the phone with Don Pitts, who organized the Pittsburgh Music Ecosystem Report. It's an 85-page report, which is the easiest 85-page report to read. Before I talked to the Post-Gazette with uh, Scott Mervis, I said, let me re read the report first. And I thought, oh, it's going to take me forever. And it was like no time at all. It's the easiest report to read. So, uh, Don, before I let you go, you were at that original town hall. What was your impression of the Pittsburgh music scene from listening to that town hall? I'll be honest, from what I, I wasn't able to attend, but from what I had heard uh, where you tried to speak and you were shouted down, I was a little embarrassed for the music scene, just being honest. I was embarrassed that that was the behavior that came from uh, people. You know, most of the musicians in this scene are very professional, but the behavior that night, from what I heard, was anything but. Yeah, I mean, I've, you know, I was asked that before, and I, you know, I've seen this, um, I've seen this happen before, and I've, I've helped other, other folks in other cities, uh, for, for years, trying to, to get some organization going in. Um, I always say they don't tackle you unless you have the ball. Uh-huh. And, uh, that's, that's what I told Abby that night. I said, Abby, they don't tackle you unless you have the ball. Abby, Abby but Goldstein think, of WYEP. You know, Station manager, just yes. to clarify uh, for those who don't know who she is. Yes, I'm sorry. No, that's okay. Uh, but I think, you know, I wasn't surprised with it. Uh, I, I think there, I think it just shows the level of frustration. Uh, I, I think the town hall was probably, I think, also a little too late in the process. Mm -hmm. uh, I think if we had done it in October or November, it would have probably been better. I think, uh, what we've learned from music communities and music is, is they're very uh, anxious. And, you know, a lot of these studies take 10, 14 months. A lot of the, the folks that, you know, do these art studies. And the music folks, like, you know, let's get something in five or six months. And so I think part of the reason why they were so frustrated is that they were just hearing all these different things out in the community. And a lot of it was, you know, a lot of it was misinformation. Um, and so we were battling the perception thing, but but ultimately, at the end of the day, I, I mean, I was surprised. Um, uh, I made it out alive, and I think we all made it out alive. But it, but it just, like I said, for me, I kind of felt, uh, you know, it, it felt it supported the the, the sense of urgency mm -hmm. that I think it needs to happen. Um, and, and you know, I saw some comment, you know, after the town hall, like, what do you expect when you get promoters and musicians and big owners and you know, all in the same room. And, you know, but I think mentality, I mean, to make, you know, for things to have to work, I mean, these different sectors are going to have to collaborate with one another. They might not, they might have to watch each other or, you know, be on each other's Christmas card list. But, <laughs> you know, they've got to, they've got to figure out how to, you know, coexist in, in, in the same ecosystem. Yeah. I agree. That's Don Pitts. He is the guy who put together the Pittsburgh Music Ecosystem Project. I'm Brian Crawford. This is The River's Edge. Up next, we've got weird news right here on The River's Edge. Hey, it's Mike Sasson. Guess what? You used to love us at 10. You're going to love us even more at 9. It's me. It's Alex. It's funniness. It's guests. It's all sorts of me yelling into microphones only one hour earlier. It's exactly what you need at 9 o'clock. It's like a shot of adrenaline. It's the Mike Sasson Show, now starting at 9 o'clock on Tuesday on the River's Edge, a new kind of radio. All right, I am Pittsburgh's number one weapon fighting the Mon monster. It's raining right now, so it's so it seems. Maybe it's the monster spitting on us. If so, I hope these three weird stories will help keep the Mon monster at bay. The first story actually is a, a thing that is for sale right now. As you know, Amazon, it's moving in to Pittsburgh and people are buying everything on Amazon. And Amazon's talking about moving in. There's shady shit going on with the city refusing to reveal the plans. But Amazon has revealed something that is really, really interesting for, for sale, very squirrely, and it could definitely trick out your neighbors. There's a squirrel that is shown to be rock climbing that you can buy 
to put on your tree. It comes complete with a vest, a hard hat, carabiners, everything. It's on Amazon right now for just 30 bucks. So if you think you can trick out your neighbors, there's an interesting item right there on sale. I thought this was hilarious. I really, really enjoyed this. I, if I had a tree, I might actually buy this. If you remember just a couple weeks ago, or was it last week, I came in with a samurai sword because Amazon has the most bizarre shit on their website, and it just becomes so irresistible sometimes to, to avoid it. It's very, very challenging. But uh, I thought that was weird. I thought it was weird enough. I thought it warranted a weird news story. I started a new group, by the way. If you're a fan of the show, look on the River Talk Facebook page, at River Talk PGH, and look for the River Talk show group. If you have weird news that you see throughout the week, you can drop it in the group, and it may even end up on air. I will be taking audience submissions for weird news now. That's in the River Talk group at River Talk PGH. Second story has to deal with hemorrhoids. Well, actually, not hemorrhoids. Something worse than hemorrhoids. What's worse than hemorrhoids, you ask? Well, imagine if a snake crept up through the toilet and bit your ass. It almost happened to one man, a Virginia Beach resident. His name is James Hooper, who originally thought it was a joke. He thought someone was pranking him. He thought it was April Fool's Day when he walked into the bathroom and saw the head of a snake sticking out of the commode, ready to bite him in the ass. Maybe that could be a cure for hemorrhoids. I don't know. That happened, though. It's real. The third weird story has to do with Kennywood's plan for the log jammer. If you remember, I said publicly on this show that it was a mistake to remove the classic, iconic log jammer. That Kennywood was trampling on memories, stomping on dreams, the iron fist of Kenny the the what is he kenny the the whatever he is the marsupial kenny the marsupial coming down on your hopes and quashing them quashing them behind the weight of that iron fist and i was proven right so kenny what is putting in a new roller coaster with a terrible terrible name the steel curtain and it's going to be part of a steelers section of the park could you come up with anything lamer? Could you come up with anything worse to fill the spot of the iconic log jammer? I was so disappointed, so dismayed when I heard that they were putting in a Steelers section. Uh, what, are they going to put another statue of Franco Harris? How many statues? How many statues in Pittsburgh do we need of Franco Harris? A guy who may or may not have caught a ball. Speaking of disparaging, the, 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 speaking of, of just the, the vast difference in how we treat people here in the city, if you're going to have probably a third statue of Franco Harris in this city, yet there are no statues of Liz Berlin. Liz Berlin, who, are, who owns Mr. Smalls right here? She, she's done a fantastic thing for the music community. Or, or what, about, what about the Clarks? They're, they, you know, they're well known. Everyone loves the Clarks in Pittsburgh, even the people who aren't. So into local music, they can relate to them, right? Or what about what about Jeremy Kaywood? He was mentioned in the in the study. He was listed. They gave him a shout out, a thank you. What about a statue for him? What about a statue for anyone else besides Franco Harris? But you know, there's going to be another Franco statue in Kennywood. You're going to be walking around, and you're you're just going to hear na 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 na. Come ride this ride, cotton candy, right over there. It's going to be rubbish horrible it, it, i'm just so annoyed with this concept and the coaster that they're building the steel curtain it's not even going to be the fastest road right in the park it's not even going to be as fast as the steel phantom they are replacing the log jammer with a subpar roller coaster a coaster that is not even going to be the best in the park trampling on dreams terrible terrible super upset about this Kennywood disaster. What are your thoughts on this? What are your thoughts on the Music Ecosystem Report? I haven't gotten any audience interaction from that. Again, you can hit us up on the text. I figured the, the lines would be lit up over this. 
412-407-2PGH, 412-407-2744. Christina has the hashtag music over Pittsburgh and says it's all about the money. Ride doesn't even look that good anyway. I agree. It's definitely worse than the, the log jammer, which was a classic, iconic Kennywood icon. A fantastic ride. I loved the log jammer. Now, I, I told the story before. I'm going to tell this story again because it's, it's so good of a story. I have memories of the log jammer. Once when I was in high school, I believe, I was out at Kennywood for the school picnic. And I was there with a friend of mine, and we were walking around, and I ran into my cousin Jody. And my cousin Jody is old enough to be my aunt, really. My dad was the youngest of five, and he actually went to high school with one of his cousins, my cousin Dean. He was my, or actually, my dad's nephew went to high school with one of his nephews. It's my cousin Dean. But Jody had a young daughter at the time, who's 18 years old now, and she was afraid of the log jammer. Jody said, please, Brian, will you take her with you to ride the log jammer? I said, of course. Why wouldn't I? So we go on to the log jammer, and Brittany was terrified of the ride. But we said, it's okay, you'll be fine. We go on the ride. And if you remember the log jammer, if you've never been there, it's a log where a small party goes onto the ride, and it goes up and down various hills, the last of which is the tallest hill. And it goes down a steep slope into the water basin below, and a little bit of water splashes on you. If you have some heavier people in the front of the, of the log, you'll get more water. If you have a bunch of lightweights... You might get spritzed a little. It's not a ride that typically soaks you, but it's a lot of fun. So we get to the top of the hill, the very top, the highest hill on the ride, and the ride breaks down. So then we had to get out of the ride and climb down the steps and go under the coaster while this poor girl is, is terrified. Not under the coaster, under the water ride, through a dirt trail and out of the park. Maybe that's why they closed it down, because it keeps breaking. But you know what? It was worth the aggravation. This whole thing started, my, my friend brought up a good point, with the magic carpet. I actually think it started with the rotor before that, where they started getting rid of the good rides and bringing in simple circle rides that just spin in a circle and do nothing else but that. It's horrible. It's boring. Very, very lame. What are your thoughts on Kennywood? We've got Christina's thoughts. What are your thoughts on the Music Ecosystem Project? I'm really excited about the opportunities that this project brings for us. I think it's obviously not going to solve the problems in Pittsburgh, and I think a lot of people thought that Don was coming in here to save the day and solve the problems of the Pittsburgh music scene. And I think if you were expecting that you were expecting a little too much. And I think if you were knocking him because you thought he was going to do that, I, I think you weren't looking at, at the situation very honestly. Because what this study does is it gives us a place to start. It gives us a, a launching point. It gives us a place where we can build the community and grow stronger as a music scene. So look at this as an opportunity, because it's a great opportunity for us, and I think there's a lot of great points brought up. And the report doesn't put down the talent of the scene. The report highlights different opportunities for us to grow. And again, like I said, it's the easiest report to read. It's an 89-page 80, report, I believe, but... Really, really easy to read. Do we want to hear some of the comments? Let's read some of the comments from other people in the music scene dealing with the report. I know I talked, I said I was going to talk about people's gas if you read the, the show notes, but I think we're going to save that until next week. People's gas is looking to get into the water scene, and I have reached out to someone on the Pittsburgh City Council to see if I can get her on the program to talk about it, and uh, I think it's going to be a really great interview if we can get that worked out. So maybe we'll save that topic until next week. But basically, you have a homework assignment. Look up the streetcars 
the streetcar system in southwestern Pennsylvania. And if you really, if you really, really, really want to get more in depth outside of just reading, go down to the Trolley Museum in Washington, PA. Take a look at that. Look at the streetcars. Look at the history of the streetcars. And then get back to me next week. And I know you're sitting there thinking, what could streetcars, what could streetcars possibly have to do with Pittsburgh water? But it does. Trust me. Just look into the streetcar systems. It's amazing. The network of streetcars that existed all throughout the region, not just in the city, but all the way out into smaller communities, communities that I grew up in, Irwin, Jeanette, different towns like that. They all had streetcars, and they connected. And there's a really interesting history about the streetcars that really pertains to Pittsburgh water, and I'm going to get into that next week. That's what we call a tease. Jeff Benton says, for those of us who actually read, or actually took the time to read the report, it's actually a non un, not it's actually a not unreasonable analysis overall whether the political will both from within and outside of the government is there to enact its recommendations however remains to be seen and someone from Austin isn't going to be able to do that for us so that's what i said yes he cannot fix the scene for us what don was hired to do was to highlight some of the issues jeff is running for council himself by the way so maybe i should bring jeff benton on to the show and see what he thinks about the pwsa situation and people's gas and their interest in getting involved in the water ben ben pinagar from gray area production says anything that helps unite our cause and efforts to provide for a better live music scene is a good thing in my opinion. We still have a lot of work to do, but this is not a bad first step in the process. And that's exactly what this is. This is a first step, this report. This report isn't going to save the Pittsburgh community, the Pittsburgh music scene. This report is not going to... It's, it's not a game changer in and of itself it's the first step towards changing the game some interesting comments here justin strong of spirit i was just at spirit last night actually i was meeting with a a friend of mine from standard broadcast and he says that it's encouraging that permits and regulations are a top opportunity for improvement as long as rules and laws allow for venues and business owners to be punished for creating a cultural identity for the region, there is little incentive for private investments to be risked. And that's true. Who in the world wants to invest in a music venue? We're talking about someone whose heart isn't in it. We're, I'm here from Mr. Small at Mr. Small's. Obviously, you have people here who have been very invested in the music scene. But if you're looking at it from a, a business standpoint you can put yourself at risk if you don't if you buy these regulations and is it something that's that's worth all of that hassle and aggravation for that's a question that a lot of investors need to ask scott from the double wide grill and the former owner of lava lounge says i have not seen the report but i have opinions well, how can you have opinions if you haven't read the report? It's an easy read, Scott. I suggest you read it. He does continue, but I'll leave it there. Uh, Christian Dolores of the Greater Pittsburgh Art Council says, Greater Pittsburgh Arts Council welcomes this report as a roadmap for intentional recommended solutions to activate our community. We are encouraged by how many diverse respondents offered reflections and suggestions for continuous improvement of our music scene. Greater Pittsburgh Arts, Arts Council looks forward to supporting a thriving arts and music scene. And Chip Demonic of Chip and the Charge Ups says, while many of my fellow artists are virtually condemning the money spent on the Pittsburgh Music Ecosystem Report, I think it's money very well spent. The reason is that I think a report from a recognized professional 
familiar with other cities' music scenes will have more credibility with the limited number of people who can influence change on an elevated level. And then he goes on to describe who those people are, including people in city government and state government and things like that. And I think that's true, too. If you bring in an outsider, yes, we may know what some of these problems are here involved in the music scene. But we're talking a lot of times very anecdotally. With this report, you have hard statistics. You have case studies from other cities who have implemented a lot of the projects that he is suggesting and you can take that report and use that information as a samurai sword, like my samurai sword, how I can can cut through. I cut through a cardboard box the other day. It was a lot of fun. But you can basically use this report as a metaphoric samurai sword to slice through the detractors in government. If they count, you, you, that's the great thing about facts and about tools like this report. When you are approached with an opposite with an opposing viewpoint you can use that to cut it down it's a sales tactic when you're in sales you need to arm yourself with basically facts statistics and figures or or information that can combat misinformation you're selling a lazy boy chair and the person says wow wow that lazy boy chair there's a lot of doodads on that chair right a lot of things that can break right well, you come back as the lazy boy salesperson, and I know because I used to be one of those people. You say, well, sir, we had offer a lifetime replacement on the parts. So the doodad, if it does go wrong, you're covered. We stand behind our parts so strongly that we will replace it. Well, with this report, when you make a statement, you can say, I stand by this statement so strongly because I have – this evidence to back me up. I can show you where it has worked in other places. So I think the report's definitely very, very, a very, very strong tool for us to use. Do we have any other comments from the crowd here? Let's see here. On the River Talk live stream, we do have. Oh, okay, this is going back to Kennywood. People want to talk about Kennywood. Christina is back on the. Back on the Kenny Wood bandwagon, so uh, let's go back to Kenny Wood. She says, "I got stuck at the, the top. I got stuck at the top of the Phantom Hill last year. I think I had about twenty-five thousand panic attacks while I was up there at night. Woo! Yeah, that's frightening. I couldn't imagine getting stuck in this uh, at the top of the still Phantom." At night, that would be terrifying. I was st stuck at the top of the pitfall before no i wasn't that's right the people before us were stuck we were in line the pitfall had just opened and I, i'm not trying to be I'm not trying to say anything that's going to offend anyone but it's just the facts of of the case the pitfall was brand new we're in line it, there's this huge line huge huge line going around the, the pitfall because it was brand new and we were very excited to check this ride out i love rides like that that take you up that that suspense and that was the 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 funniest or the most suspenseful part of the pitfall is you're up at the top of this ride and you're waiting and waiting and waiting for this thing to fall and the anxiety was agonizing because when you're afraid of heights the most terrifying Part of it is really the weight, not knowing when you're going to fall. So we're in line, and the pitfall tries to go up, and there's a lot of people who are, are very portly, all on one car, and the car would not go up. And since that day, they put restrictions on how many people who are, are larger people can be on one car at a time. But it was great for us because we moved right to the front of the line. No one else wanted to wait for the pitfall to, uh, to get repaired. So we just moved to the front of the line. It was fantastic. I did not have to worry about waiting because there's nothing, nothing worse 
than waiting. Again, if you give us your thoughts, we may revisit. We'll, we'll definitely revisit this topic at some point, I'm sure, the Pittsburgh Music Ecosystem Project. I think it's a great thing. I think it's a great starting point, and I'm excited to see where it takes us. If you have any more comments on Kennywood, any more comments on the project, please let us know. We will address your comments throughout the week. Don't forget to sign up for the River Talk group, the River Talk Show Talk group here on Facebook, where you can become part of the show even before the show airs. Don't forget, you're listening to the River's Edge Radio Network, and you can tell your smart speaker to play the River's Edge station on TuneIn to listen to us right there from your Amazon Echo or Google Home device. I'm Brian Crawford. This is the River's Edge. This is Pittsburgh's voice for local music, the best 24-hour local music radio station in town. Don't forget to check out our sister station, The Metal Edge, over at MetalEdgePGH.com as well. Mike Sasson is going to be here on the live feed at 9 p.m., I'm Brian Crawford. I'll be back Friday night, 6 p.m., right here on The River's Edge.